Well, welcome, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening for every time zone available. Uh, welcome to today's webinars. Um, in this webinar, we're going to talk a little bit more about tactile control. So control you can touch, control you can feel for uh, our DSP and hardware systems. Um, for those who have watched our other webinars or one of our other webinars, uh, in the, on the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. You uh, will open the chat window. You can ask your questions there. And we have a Q&A section at the end where we will reply to your questions. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I hope you enjoy and um, let's start the webinar. So today, a little bit more about tactile control. And I'm going to start with a little bit on the background. So 2002, even before, but 2002 was the big, was the first product where we had uh, our own hardware. We introduced IDR4 and IDR8. And the power of IDR4 and IDR8 were the simplicity. So you had a 16 by 16 matrix, uh, fully uh, uh, fixed DSP. Uh, all the power in there, it was controllable through RS232 or through ethernet, which in 2002 was quite uh, new. But we also had lots of hardware controllers um, available for the IDR4 and IDR8. So we had faders, we had rotaries, we had small push buttons, we even had a small remote display and also infrared remote control. So you could integrate it with a universal remote control. All those uh, PLs, uh, we called them, uh, were running on PLA net, which was using a CAT cable, but we didn't use ethernet. We used a serial protocol, RS485, uh, with phantom power uh, around uh, to power the PL units. So um, you could use the CAT cabling, which at that time was not, was a standard, but not uh, highly available in buildings. So uh, you wouldn't worry about putting that PLA net cable into your computer. If you used the ethernet port of your computer, again, at those days, very rare, um, you would blow out your, um, uh, uh, your Ethernet port because there was no PoE standard at that time. So our PLA net power was a lot of power for them. So that was 2002. So we introduced for DLive to start with different kind of IP controllers. Um, we stepped away from PLA net and because Ethernet is a common protocol these days, we are using the layer three protocol including PoE to control our IP controllers. So the IP controllers work with DLive, Avantage and AHM. And uh, the power of that control is that it's fully universal. So any of those systems can simply connect to an IP controller and then assign um, attributes to a button or a rotary through a drop-down menu. Besides the hardware controls, we also have third-party pro pro uh, protocols which you can use. So for example, AMX, Extron, Crestron, uh, or any control system that can uh, send and receive uh, serial commands over ethernet uh, can be used to control uh, an Avantis, a DLive, SQ even, uh, and Q also, or AHM64. And a good thing to know is that you can use these protocols besides the IP controller. So it's not if or, but you can use them at the same time. Same thing is for custom control, which is our own custom control uh, protocol where you, you, we allow you to build your own uh, interface for your end user. And that can also be used at the same time as with your IP controllers. Uh, you can even make an interface where you have hardware controllers tactile with glass available. And for uh, the people who didn't notice yet, we just brought out two touchscreen panels, which natively come uh, with custom control out of the box. So the only thing you have to do is plug in an ethernet cable with PoE and it works. That comes in a seven and a 10 inch. So back to tactile hardware controllers. So what kind of controllers do we have? We have available IP1, which comes in two version. 
uh, two versions, IP6, six rotaries and a few displays, IP8 with eight motorized faders and a GPIO unit to give you more general purpose in and outputs. So let's have a little closer look at the IP controllers. So IP1 comes in two versions. We have an European version, which is a square one, and we have the US version, which is the rectangular one. Um, each fit US Decora or Honeywell MK elements, and the IP1 itself comes in black or white. So you can choose what fits the best with your faceplate. There is a little adapter in the making, uh, so we can also fit it in Jira, um, Jung, and et cetera, every 50, 50, 55 by 55 uh, mil um, faceplate. So the rotary has a push and turn button, so it has two functions. One function is to uh, just take the rotary and turn it for level control, cross point control, whatever you want. And if you push it, you can have it as a, a scene selector or preset selector or a source selector, which allows you to select a source or at the end user select a source for the zone you are in. These IP1 controllers are powered through PoE, standard PoE, so maximum of 15 watts. I think they use about seven watts each. On an AHM system, you can use 64 IP1 controllers at the same time. So IP6 controllers. IP6 is something that's normally used on a desk, um, uh, has feet underneath it, and we have a plate which allows you to build it into a desk or into a wall, which is a mounting kit. Again, six rotaries, push and turn, six buttons on the top row, six buttons on the lower row, and six displays. Uh, you can use the rotaries for level control, cross point levels, uh, or you can use them as source selection or preset selection. Uh, you have six layers available uh, and the buttons on the lower row of the rotaries uh, are with a DLive and Aventus uh, used for layers. Uh, and on AHM, you can choose that to be preset selection, mutes, whatever you want it to be. One thing nice about um, the IP controllers, and that's the same for the DX, AB, AR, and GX audio racks, is that they are equipped with something that's called automatic firmware matching, auto firmware matching, AFM, uh, which automatically matches the firmware of the audio DSP connected. A little bit more on that later on. And hardware controller wise, IP8, which is eight motorized faders. 16 buttons and six layers. Again, AHM, you can change them to be something else. They're TCP IP layer three compliant and PoE plus compliant. So it needs a little bit more juice. So a PoE plus is 30 watts. Uh, so it needs a little bit more juice for that one. And again, automatic firmware matching. That it's TCP IP layer three means that you can use it on a, a normal house network. So if you are in a building and uh, you want to utilize it uh, over the house network, you can simply add these to the house network. If your IT manager is going to ask questions, there's a white paper on our website uh, on the resources uh, page, which tells you exactly which ports we are using, what's the payload, what's the bandwidth we are using, et cetera, et cetera. All the technical details you need to know for your IT manager can be found in the document on IP controllers on our resources page. And then the last one is our GPIO interface. A GPIO interface, general purpose in or out interface, is um, something where you can use for uh, simple uh, switches. So if you have a switch uh, contact closure uh, system. You can simply have eight inputs. So uh, let's say you want to have a big switch, press it, and you need to trigger something. You can use this device and the GPO, the outputs, are relay outputs that can trigger something, an LED, a relay, or whatever you want. You can use this for buttons. Uh, if you have a situation where you want to uh, use room combining, so opening and closing a, a, a wall or a door, you can use those as a switch input for your system to trigger something. 
Again, the power of this thing is that it's networkable. So you can place this anywhere you want. If you have a fire installation, you can simply take one ethernet cable, bring it to the fire installation and uh, wire it up. So your signal cables are not that long. Uh, DC powered or PoE. So if you need a system with, uh, or GPIOs with redundant power supplies, you can also use this one. So again, DLive Avantis AHM64 is where you can use the IP controllers. You cannot use the IP controls with our Q or SQ system. So IP controller range, PoE compa compatible, IP1 is PoE only, keep in mind, IP8 is PoE plus, and all controllers use la Ethernet layer three, and all controllers have automatic firmware matching implemented. So how many IP controllers can I use on my system? So a DLive has 16 plus 16 IP1s to IP8s and eight plus eight GPIOs. And why do I say 16 plus 16? On a DLive system, you have your DM, which is your mix rack, and you have your control servers, which is your S or your C class control servers. And you can connect 16 IP controllers to each system. So you can connect 16 IP controllers to the memory of the DM0 and 16 to the memory of the control servers. Same for GPIOs in that case. So for example, if you have a situation where you are in a club and um, you have a live act playing and after the show you want to make sure that the dj is still going on for two hours you connect your ip controller to your dm physically so the in, in memory you can simply connect it to the network but in software you connect it to the dm and then when you disconnect the control service you still have control over your dm through your ip controller with avantis because you only have one system you can connect 16 ip6 uh, one six to eight and eight GPIOs. On AHM64, you can connect 64 IP1s. So each zone can have one IP1. 16 IP6s, 16 IP8s and eight GPIOs. So that means on an AHM system, you can have 66 GPIO ports available for external switching. And then another thing that's value to know on a DLive system, you have a maximum of 40 TCP IP connections. And remember, the service connection to the DM rack is already two connections. Um, if you're using director or if you're using um, uh, a third party pro pro control, that's also one IP connection. Uh, same thing for Avantis. And with AHM64, we allow you to have a maximum of 100 TCP IP connections. And we think that should be fairly enough on AHM. So this automatic firmware matching, what is it? So all our IO boxes have uh, automatic firmware matching implemented. Keep in mind that our Dante boxes, DT boxes, do not have automatic firmware matching implemented because you simply do not want automatic updating of a Dante device if the rest is not automatically updating. That's why we haven't implemented it there. So how does it work? So we have a DSP, which can be a DLive engine, which can be an Avantis engine or an AHM64 engine. There is a data link on all our IO boxes. That's a layer two data link on our IP controllers. That's a layer three data link. There's a handshake. The IP controller or IO box tells the system, hey, I'm running on, in this case, 1.6. The DSP is telling you, yeah, but I'm still running on 1.2 because I'm already installed for uh, 10 years. Then the DSP simply sends out new firmware to the IP controller and the IP controller is up or downgraded automatically. Uh, you will, the only thing you will notice is as an installer is that you will uh, see 10 seconds of uh, waiting time and then the IP controller reboots a, uh, a bit. So it takes about 20 to 30 seconds before an IP controller is fully updated for uh, the extract. If you don't know this is going on, you probably will have never noticed this. The power of this is that you can simply take a broken unit, or if you have an install which is already there for five years, you don't, do not have to go into your books and see, because we all document our installs quite well. 
to see, hey, I have this firmware running in this install. Uh, I need to bring this down to this version. No, simply bring the IP controller to your location, plug it in, and all is set. So how do we set up an IP controller? Um, in principle, it's all the same. The interface looks a bit different on all our systems. So on AHM, we have one interface, which allows you to do your unit GPIO, your unit level sensing, and our IP controllers. Uh, on Avantis, uh, you have one page, and on DLive, you have a software page for your DM rack, and you have a software page for your control service. And as you can also see, we have slots here. And each slot will keep the memory of a connected IP controller. A little bit more on that later. So the configuration in this case is stored in a physical slot. So we have selected the IP1, we have the physical slots, and the configuration itself is stored inside this slot. And we connect an IP controller to that slot. And when we make that connection, two things will happen. First of all, the system will check what the firmware of the IP controller connected is. If it's not matching, it will match it. And when it's matched, it will automatically push the configuration inside that slot to the IP controller. So the IP controller itself is a complete dumb unit. You don't have to log in uh, and upload a configuration into that IP controller. It will automatically retrieve it from the IP, from the DSP. One thing that's also nice is that the configurations in those slots are stored in the presets. So if we change a preset, we can make a choice to also change the configuration in that preset or in that slot. If we do so, we will send a complete new configuration to the IP controller. Again, an end user won't notice anything because the payload is very small. So the only thing the end user will see is we'll see the layout switching. So we can turn uh, IP controllers blank or we can send a completely different configuration because we close the door or we open the door in a, a room. That makes the IP controllers quite powerful. Again, how many slots can you have on the system? So because the configuration is stored inside the slot, we can also, in case that uh, it is a hardware controller, we have end users touching this device. Um, In-house, we have somebody who's called Jim, uh, who's doing all the hardware testing. And if I tell you, Jim used to be a tank driver and has very large feet, uh, I can tell you the, those devices are quite well tested. But uh, in a case where an IP controller fails or breaks down, um, the configuration of that IP controller is still stored inside the slot. So we can simply take another IP controller, which we send out from the warehouse, and replace it with a new one, and the configuration is being sent directly to that IP controller. Now, we have can have 64 IP controllers in a system, so each IP controller should have an identical name and IP address. Um, and we also thought of that one. So there is a little web interface built into the IP controller where you can change the name and the IP address of the IP controller. So something you can do in your warehouse is simply connect your IP controller to a PoE switch, um, open up a web browser on any computer system. You can even do it on your mobile phone. When there's no config being sent to the IP controller, it will display uh, its IP address. So type that IP address into the web browser and you will see the web page on your computer. Now you can change the IP address and name, put it back in the box, ship it out to your customer. Your customer can uh, plug it into uh, his system, his or her system, and voila, the configuration is being sent to that IP controller and the system is working as it is. Uh, as far as I know, this is quite unique and uh, makes your after sales and your repair and your service system very easy. So sending out configs to your unit. Setting up this IP controller, 
is also quite simple. So we select a slot what we want to do. In this case, we have an IP1. We can see we have a main and we have a shift. So the main is when we normally use it and the shift is when we push it. And we have a drop down menu on this side. So if we select the main, we get our drop down menu. And we can see we can choose from input level, zone output level, control group level, input cross point, and zone cross point. We simply select a function and it's being set to that button. On an IP6, we also have buttons. The buttons have a few things. First of all, there's a press and a release, a little bit more on it later, and a drop down menu with the function. So we can simply push the drop down menu and we see a full list of items we can assign to this physical button. One second, uh, missing one. Yeah. The press and release uh, will have two functions. So you can add two functions to one button. A press is a simple, I push the button and that will trigger a function. And the moment I release it, it will trigger a second function. So we can use this, for example, for a talk. So when I press it, it unmutes the channel. And when I release it, it mutes the channel again. Or I can use it for, uh, I want to start a jingle. And when the jingle, uh, I want to stop the jingle, it will automatically stop the jingle when I release it. So two functions we can trigger uh, with one button in this case. Then we have our layers. And in our case, we can choose to have different layers for a user. Or we can simply say a user doesn't see layers. They only see the configuration. So a user cannot get confused in where they are, what they want. Um, just make it simple. Then I've told you that all the slots of those IP controllers are stored in presets. And when you store a preset in an AHM64 or in DLive or in Avantis, you will store everything. Upon recall, you tell on an AHM system what you want to be recalled in the recall scope. And that recall scope is as granular that we can choose to say, hey, I only want IP 1, uh, 2 to, uh, in slot 2 to be recalled, or IP 6, uh, 1 to be recalled, or all of them to be recalled, and I want the rest of the system to be left alone. This also means we can uh, make a, a controller go uh, black, for example, automatically at six o'clock because that's closure time. Uh, or in the case of an evacuation, uh, we can disable all functions, make all the displays go red and uh, make sure that nobody can interfere with the evac announcement. Uh, all those little things can make your life a lot easier. I've created a little example where on all of our systems, you can emulate the IP controllers. And in this case, I have emulated an IP8 on the left, and I have made a few presets where I have stored different configurations. So preset one is one to eight, preset two is eight to one, and preset 12 is blank. And I've also assigned those presets to the physical uh, knobs on the controller. So in this case, I can simply move around and I can turn the system off like I did now, or I can turn the system on by just simply pushing on a button and sending a complete configuration. So why would I do that in a configuration? Because if I do it in a configuration, I can also make the choice to change specific items in my DSP, um, which could go together or maybe completely do not go together. And turning off a physical controller, uh, is possible, but in our case, we just unassign all the, uh, the functions of that controller and it looks for the end user that the system is off. What if we have multiple AHM systems or DLive or Avanta systems in the, in the building, all connected with uh, IP controllers? So let's say I want to have 128 IP, IP1 controllers on one system. We have a clever system which allows you to link the preset system of multiple uh, LNE devices. And we do this 
through a system that's called embedded recall. Embedded recall allows you to trigger a preset after you have triggered a preset. And you can set a specific time to trigger a preset. The nice thing is that you can do it on a local device. For example, I recall preset one, and after two seconds, I want the system to be reverted back to what I wanted to do, what I was doing. So my preset two was my, uh, what I was doing. So I trigger preset one, and after two seconds, I want trigger a preset two to be triggered. I can do this through an embedded recall, but I can also do this on an other AHM, which is in the same network. So in this case, I have two AHMs, this AA AHM and another AHM in my system. And I can add to my list rules where in this case, um, after when I uh, recall preset reset, preset 14 is recalled directly. After 3.2 seconds, preset 14 is recalled on the local unit. And then preset 18 is recalled after 6.6 .6 seconds on the remote unit after this one. So we can make a lot of AHMs devices and you can connect as many as you want. Uh, the limitation is your, your network and, and how your subnet is being set up um, to control whatever you want. Source selection. So the source selection is another item which, uh, or another tool to give your end user the ability to quickly select a source. So on AHM, each zone output has a source selector. And on DLive and Avantage, you have 20 source selectors which are available. So how does a source selector work? We have sources, up to 20 different sources, which uh, we can set into the source selector by simply adding them with a plus button. And then when I push this row tree, I get a list with all my inputs. And if I, for example, use input one, I can name that input one differently on each IP controller or on each zone. So one input can have 64 different names if I want to. So and when I have selected that input, I press the button again, and it, that input is physically going to the zone output. On AHM, I can also add a preset into the system. So for example, I want to do a routing uh, item and I want to do an announcement because we are in a club and I want to announce at eight o'clock the uh, show is gonna start. So in that case, I can simply trigger a preset that does all the routing for me. The preset will also trigger an audio file to be played back because we have 3.7 gigs of internal memory in the AHM for audio playback. And the embedded recall will after 10 seconds when the announcement is done, will revert back to the state where all the routing was in before we started the preset. Uh, again, we can have 20 items in that list of presets. A nice thing to know is that I can still route any audio input to that zone or even every zone output back into a zone without having any issues. So the source selection only works on the channels assigned to the source selector and I can route any audio channel back in to the system. Um, here we have a few examples. And in this example, we have a, a venue where we have two rooms, a big venue and a small venue, and we have a lobby and we have breakout rooms. So in a big venue, we are using an SQ5 for larger events and an IP8 for day-to-day -day events for uh, if we don't need an engineer. The small venue, we use the IP6 for day-to-day. -day. We can control uh, three steady mic inputs and two instrument inputs and the master output, of course. Breakout rooms, we have multiple. Uh, you can have as many as you want. Music, main hall, so the big venue, and silence. Sometimes that seems to be important in a breakout room. And for the, for the lobby, we have system control. So we want to be able to shut everything down. We need to do music selection for the lobby. <clears throat> and we want to um, have an event start announcement automated um, from the IP controller. So people in the lobby or the, the manager in the lobby should be able to simply select 
an option where they can start announcement for something is happening in the big venue, something is happening in the small venue. Again, in this case, I have emulated this um, IP6, IP8, and two IP1 controllers. You can see this one is in slot one, this one is in slot two. And we're going to start with controlling something from the IP1 in slot one. As you can see, we can turn the system on. And when we turn the system on, all the other IP controllers come online. We can then choose what we want on the IP controller. Uh, we can turn everything off. When we turn everything off, all the other IP controllers go, wrong, go blank. On the breakout rooms, we can control stuff. On the IP controllers, we can control stuff. We have a main level and we have input levels. And on the IP controllers, we also have input levels. Breakout rooms, where we can turn items on or off, radio, Spotify, or what do you say, off. So in this case, we have built a system within five minutes with multiple controllers, with a few presets uh, for a complete venue. And because it's all drop down menu, if you have in the workflow in your mind, you can build this really, really fast. This is another example where we have a control system in house. Uh, in this case, probably a Crescent or an AMX system. There uh, is a video switch. Uh, AHM64 is taking care of all the audio mixing. But the end user said, uh, we want to have a touch screen on the, on the conference table. But we also want some tactile control for lights, shading, uh, audio level, all the items we want to see. So we gave them an IP8 and an IP1. And because we can set these items, for example, to adjust a control group or to control something we don't use inside the AHM, it will send a control command to the control system. That control system then can translate it to the shading, to the lights, to whatever we want, and gives us tactile control over a fader to a control system. And that's two way. So if the control system wants to adjust the fader, it can simply send a command and the fader will go to the value being sent by the control system. Again, that makes it really quick and easy. And because AHM64 is a flexible DSP architecture, all the hooks for the control system are already fixed. So we don't have to worry that we made a mistake or the person who built the control system programming all the hooks are there and we can use it. In this case, we have a large hotel, um, multiple AHM64s, uh, which are all connected to a down to backbone on our audio and a TCP IP backbone to control for IP controllers. So on the ground floor, we have uh, all the controls. So the ground floor AHM is the, the, the master, if I'm still allowed to use it. Um, IP6 controlling that AHM64, uh, Dante coming into that network, that's a different discussion. We also have up to 48 rooms or up to 64 rooms in our case, but in this case, 48 rooms, uh, which can be breakfast rooms, uh, hotel, uh, or sorry, restaurant, uh, uh, swimming pool, whatever you want, guest rooms, which can be controlled uh, their zone level and their source selection. But in some cases, we also want to do an announcement to all the other systems. For example, we want to do an evac, or we want to do a reset of a complete floor for the rooms, or there is a wedding going on on the third floor. And we want to make sure that all the guests in that room get an audio from uh, the party. Um, we can all control that from a central control room through embedded re recall through the whole system without adding a control system in this case. Again, SQ5s can plug in directly into the S-Link port of the ASM64, which allows us to quickly route audio into the whole system. So you see quite an advanced, uh, a lot of rooms, a lot of places, but still simple control to an IP6 and a lot of IP1s. Then we get into GPIO. So GPIO unit, networkable, 
how do we use it uh, there are, for example in the uk there are a lot of churches who are still used to having a lot of buttons to turn audio in specific areas on or off um, they can use a gpio system because they can use the same switchboard they can take the same switches if they want to uh, and the switch output is being brought into the GPI uh, from a GPIO port. And then we can use the output of the GPIO to or uh, light a LED or to light the light bulb that's still in there. So you can choose what you want to do. And the nice thing about this one is that if you, for example, you want to make a small remote with eight buttons, uh, self-illuminating buttons, the only thing you have to do is build a box eight buttons, put a GPIO unit in there, and there's only one CAT5 cable or higher coming into that box, which has power for the LEDs, uh, power for the switches if you want to, and uh, power for the GPIO unit. Because all is powered over GPIO, and we still have some voltage output left here. So we can use that voltage output to power LEDs or power all different things. So only one cable for your whole system to work. But you can also use the system for conference systems. For example, in this example, we use Azure MX400, which has an LED ring uh, indicator if it's muted or not. We can take control over that LED ring and we can take control over their switch. So if somebody presses that switch, the DSP mutes the channel inside the DSP instead of with the switch and then sends out a signal to the LED to turn to red. This also means that from the DSP, we can give an indication to all the microphones connected. And in an AHM64, we have 64 inputs, 64 outputs, but we're also having the ability to do 66 GPIs and 66 GPOs. So if you have a conference system with 64 microphones, we can also control them fully. Um, and because it's networkable, you can place GPIOs anywhere you want. So again, there are some white papers on uh, how to wire microphones with the GPIOs on our website, if you want to use them in this case. I think we are done with, with the, this part of the webinar. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I don't know if there are any questions so far. Hi, Martijn. Uh, yeah, we, we have Hi, a couple of questions, but by all means to, to all attendees, uh, please uh, send in any questions you have so you can still type away in the Q&A uh, window and uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to answer. Uh, so a couple of the questions that came in, one you actually covered just now about um, wiring uh, microphones, conference microphones with GPIO. Uh, and if people want to find more information, you said there is a white paper on the, on the website with more example. Yeah, they're on the resources uh, section of our website where you can find a lot of information. Um, there is a white paper on GPIO, which has Earthworks, Shure, and Audio Technica microphones in there uh, as an example. Very good. Uh, the, the other question we had earlier in the presentation on the IP controllers is about IP addresses and specifically, can they work with DHCP? And if so, when would you recommend using DHCP or a static IP address for the, for the controllers? Yeah, so the controls can work with DHCP. Um, you can uh, tick a box and then they will use the IP address allocated to them. In most installs, I would recommend you to use fixed IP addresses simply because you then know which IP controller has which IP address. The IP slots are assigned on the naming. So um, uh, the name defines where they get their information, but still it's recommended to use fixed IP addressing. Thank you. A question from Rick on the IP uh, controllers again, on whether uh, any of these are IP rated, so rated for outdoor use um, and different weather conditions. Yeah, I think they're all uh, rated IP0. No, we, we don't have any IP rating on them. Um, so we don't recommend to use them in rain or in, in situations where they can get wet. 
um, they are built with live consoles in mind. So I don't think they will break down when they have a few splats of, of, of uh, fluid, but uh, we don't support it and we don't have an IP rating for them. Thanks for that. And uh, a question from uh, Jason about uh, using IP controllers with third party systems like QSYS. This is um, a very common question well, common that we question. get. So do, do you want to answer that one, Martin? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. So um, uh, there's no, there, yes and no, there's no really paperwork to use them. So we are using a, a proprietary protocol, which is called AHNet, uh, which we use ourselves. Um, there has been some discussion if we could implement that uh, directly into QSYS. Right now, the simplest way is to simply buy um, an AHM64, uh, use the drivers uh, inside the uh, QSYS system, which uh, can communicate with AHM64. And uh, to, to be uh, quicker with your question, probably, is there a driver for QSYS? No, there isn't, because the implementation of QSYS drivers is so simple uh, with AHM that you can simply take our TCP IP protocol uh, and use it yourself. In that case, yes, you can use the IP controllers through the AHM as translator with a QSYS system. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Actually, you, you can control third party systems and equipment uh, with an IP controller via the AHM64 uh, and make the AHM64 send strings maybe on a preset recall and so on um, and commands to, to other devices. Um, Right, so I think that uh, covers all questions from um, from our attendees. If there's more, again, feel free to pop them in uh, into the okay. Q&A. And if not, Martin, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to uh, close the webinar. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, thank you all for, for watching. Um, we have a few more uh, webinars coming up, uh, and if you are fed up with all the webinars. I can imagine that we we did a few this year and everybody is anxious to get back to work. Um, at 5 p.m. GMT, we have a hangout with the team, which we is a little bit more informal where you can ask questions. Uh, I don't know if we answer private questions, but you can at least ask questions about all of the LNE products uh, or any applications you want. Uh, if we don't see you anymore, uh, I hope to see you somewhere in the world in real life soon. And uh, thank you for watching the webinar. Goodbye.